Hi, sweet friends. I'm Mary from marysnest.com, where I share traditional recipes for making nutrient-dense foods using simple ingredients. And today, this is News from the Nest, where I'm going to answer some questions that I've been getting from viewers. First and foremost, why do I sometimes use metal caps and other times use paper caps when I'm making ferments? So why do I sometimes use metal caps and other times use paper caps? That's a really good question. First of all, the reason that I use metal caps is here I'm making a ferment, in this case sauerkraut, that's based on good bacteria growing. And what we want to do is, I'm going to loosen this cap right now, and it may, oh see, I don't know if you can hear that. It's releasing all of the carbon dioxide that is created during the fermentation process. <laughs> oh, no, oh my goodness, as you can see, it's bubbling over. That's why I have the uh, uh, dishcloth here on the counter. But what happens is you put your vegetables in here. In this case, it's um, the cabbage for making the sauerkraut. And you add salt, and then you put a weight on top to press it down, and then you put your lid on and put it in a warm place to let it go through its fermentation process. And what we want to do here is keep out the oxygen. And we want to keep everything under water uh, while it goes through the fermentation process. And keeping out the, I'm just slowly uncapping this little by little. Uh, the reason we want to keep out the oxygen is that prevents bad bacteria from growing and gives the good bacteria a chance to grow. And why does the good bacteria grow? The reason it grows is that the cabbage is a prebiotic. And I also add in, uh, for my little insurance policy, which I share in my sauerkraut video, uh, I add a little uh, apple, because apple, a little ground up apple, because apple is very high in pectin. And uh, pectin is also a prebiotic. So you give the good bacteria a lot of things that it can eat in order to go on and make the probiotics thereby making this a very probiotic rich uh, side dish or condiment depending on how you uh, serve and eat um, sauerkraut. Well, in any event, I'm going to continue to let this fizz, but I hope that gives you an explanation as uh, to why I use the metal cap. Now, with the sauerkraut, uh, with, no, this is the sauerkraut, this is vinegar that I made from strawberry scraps. And this is something as I've shared with you all in the past. Um, this is something that I learned to do from Heidi over at Rain Country Homestead, and I'll link to her channel below so you can learn more about uh, making fruit scrap vinegar uh, from her. She makes it from everything. She's amazing. Uh, but the reason that you use a paper cap here, and I'm just going to pull this off, and not a metal cap is because in this process we want to encourage the wild yeast that's in the air to enter in and help uh, with the fermentation process. And how we help that yeast is by first of all using some you know, scrap, or you can use apple cores, or you know, in this case I use strawberry tops, some type of fruit, or you can also, as Heidi has shown, done it with flowers and things off of trees. Uh, it's very, very interesting. And you add a quarter cup of sugar, and you stir it and let it mix, let it sit for a few days, add some more uh, sugar, another quarter cup, and then you let it sit for about a month, and it eventually will turn into vinegar. And it, it goes through that process because of the wild yeast feeding off the sugar and then creating a, an environment that is acidic, which does not allow for uh, bad bacteria to grow, but instead allows for the yeast to proliferate and good bacteria to pro proliferate, uh, making this uh, also very rich in probiotics. You often hear with vinegars, homemade vinegar has the mother. You can also buy it at the store, uh, but all of your homemade vinegars are going to have the mother, meaning the, uh, the good 
probiotics that uh, develop uh, with the wild yeast and being fed in the sugar and then uh, the good bacteria being able to survive, crowd out the bad bacteria because of the acidic environment that you've made. And that's that. And you just stir as you can see. I'm hoping that you can see this. It's, uh, a little this is still in the process of turning into vinegar, but I'm definitely uh, beginning to start to be able to smell it. Yeah, it's definitely starting to smell, uh, get that vinegary smell, and it also still has um, the delightful strawberry uh, fragrance as well. But anyways, I don't want to ramble on. That's the bottom line. So it really comes down to this, that the, and, and I'm not a scientist, this is just kind of, you know, a home cook's uh, little explanation that here we're creating an anaerobic environment, meaning no oxygen, and encouraging the good bacteria to eat the prebiotics that are in here, in this case, uh, cabbage and um, the apple, and create a nice fermented uh, vegetable. And in this, we're creating that environment through encouraging wild yeast. And really, the reason you pick one over the other is what you're looking for in your end product. Um, in this one, if you tried to culture sauerkraut using wild yeasts, it would be very unusual and not really sauerkraut because you would have to have a lot of water, so you'd have the cabbage in a lot of water, and you'd be feeding sugar every day. And I'm not really quite sure how that would turn out. So I don't know if anybody ever tried it, but I'd be interested to hear in the comments below. But uh, so it's really a matter of what are you trying to do? Are you trying to uh, ferment a vegetable like cabbage, uh, carrots, um, you know, all sorts of things? Those then are going to be done in an anaerobic environment under a weight with a tight lid that. Um, will prevent oxygen coming in. And normally what I do is there are all kinds of different things that you can use when you make uh, uh, sauerkraut and other fermented vegetables. Uh, I just use a little, I put in a little jelly jar. It's like a four ounce jelly jar to weight everything down. You can also use those uh, glass pebbles that you may have seen that are manufactured specifically for this process. But I find the little jelly jar works just fine. and. I use a canning lid as opposed to a white plastic lid, and that's another question that I received, is because this exact uh, reason what you're seeing me do here, when I release the uh, carbon dioxide that builds up, I normally do this every day, but I, I forgot and I left this for a few days, so it's really built up quite a bit. Uh, if I use the white plastic lid, when I loosened it, it creates like, woof, you know, a lot of carbon dioxide comes out and it frightens me a little. Um, so this, what I like to do, is I can just release this band, let some of the carbon dioxide be released, and then just tighten it again and let it go on fermenting another day, so on and so forth. And then, once the sauerkraut is where I like it, and I'll take, I'm just gonna do this in one fell swoop because I think that it's really going to bubble over a lot. But as you can see, look at that. Look at the, it's making a little bit of a mess here. But, <coughs> excuse me, look at how much fermentation has taken place. This is amazing and it's really come quite nicely. So I'm just gonna continue to release this. Look at this bubbling over, oh my goodness. This has really <laughs> fermented a lot. So, I've got a little bit of a mess on my hands here. I'm gonna have to get another dish towel. <laughs> oh, it smells delicious though. You can really smell the sauerkraut. And I'm just gonna take this and be done with it. <laughs> Alrighty, now, here is the little jelly jar that I use. And my hands are clean. And I'm just gonna pour that right back in there. So you see, this is what I use. Just this is a little four ounce uh, canning jar for when you can up jellies and whatnot. And it works beautifully to hold everything 
and keep everything submerged under the liquid. And as you can sell, tell, you know, it, it fermented beautifully. So now this is when I do use the white plastic lid. I'll put this on just finger tight and I'll put this in the refrigerator uh, to cool down and then we can use this uh, as a little uh, condiment you know with hot dogs or whatever or uh, a little more of a side dish uh, with meat dinners and so on and so forth but this white lid works well for storage because the fermentation is going to slow down considerably uh, once I put this in the refrigerator so that is that and then here uh, with the paper lids, I'm going to, when this vinegar is ready, and it's, I think it's getting close to ready. It's really smelling like vinegar. I do still smell a little bit of the strawberry, um, or, or I should say, I smell it a little stronger than in my last batch. So I'm thinking that this may not be as, 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 as acidic as I want it yet. But when I get ready to strain this out, I'll just strain this through a um, strainer and for the first pass. And then in the second pass, I'm going to line the strainer with um, a flour sack towel, or you can use cheesecloth, you know, whatever you have, uh, to strain out any little bits and pieces that may not have been caught the first time uh, through the regular strainer. But to get all, all the large solids and whatnot, I'll just use the, the uh, regular st strainer first that's not lined. Because if I pour everything in when it's lined, it just goes real slow and it gets clogged up. So that's just my little tip. I like to do it in, a, in two phases. Now what I want to do, because I've talked about this also and people have had some questions, is I wanted to show you the pH strips that I was talking about. Now, again, so I explained, you know, why uh, we do the uh, sauerkraut this way. And so why do we do the vinegar this way? Why can't we, you know, just pack it with fruit and put a weight on it? And the reason for that is when we're making vinegar, we want to encourage the wild yeasts to get in. Um, if we packed this thing with fruit, added some salt, which would be kind of unusual, but that's generally how you are going to ferment your vegetables, and then put it weights on top of it, you'd create something that was different than vinegar. Uh, I'd be interested, I've never done it, so I'd be interested in hearing if any of you have tried doing something like that, and what was it, that it, how did it turn out, you know, what did you make? Uh, I feel it might be like a little bit of a salty fruit. So in any event, I'm going to just put this pH strip in. Wow, it looks like this may be very close to ready. Now I want to show you this. So that, I put it in there and it turned yellow. And then you'll see the pH strips have this little grid here to tell you what, uh, I'm going to try to bring this a little closer so you can really get a good look at that if you can see that. And then we, what you do is you line this up and you see where in here it matches. So it looks somewhere maybe between the 3.0 and the 3.5. Approximately, I'm not sure exactly how the colors will transfer on the camera, but that way you can see something. Now, I just want to show you, you might say, oh, it just got wet and it turned yellow. No, it really, it really is a pH strip. And I'm going to show you because I'm going to put this, I'm just going to go over to my sink and put this under water and you'll see what color it turns. Okay. Alrighty. I just put a little bit of my sink water and can you, can you see that? It turned green. So it's got the water from my tap has a much higher pH, more something like 5.5 almost. So that's, I find that interesting. But this is a good thing to have. These pH strips are very reasonable. You can get them anywhere. You can get them at a pharmacy. You can get them um, at a, uh, on Amazon, you know. 
pretty much anywhere. But they're helpful, especially in the process of making the vinegar, so that you can get an idea of what the uh, acid level is and uh, has it actually become vinegar if you're not 100% sure. Certainly you can taste it and all of that, and you'll start to smell it, and you'll definitely be able to, I, I feel, know that it's vinegar. But if you're a beginner at this, the pH strips might give you some um, sense of comfort knowing that it's reached the acidic level that you like. And I usually, going back to these, I usually like to um, get my vinegar at a three point, about a 3.0. I like to get it very, very acidic, but you can uh, strain it, you know, even if it's at 4.0 or 4.5. So that's just something to know too. Now with the sauerkraut, you can see that this is really fermented with all the bubbles and this really is best tested via the taste test. Now, if you're new to making fermented vegetables and you're a little worried because you're like, oh no, is it bad or is it good? I don't know, I don't know. Trust your nose. When you smell sauerkraut like this, it smells like cabbage, kind of like the way cabbage smells when it's cooked. But in addition to that, it also has like a, a tangy, a little bit of a, almost, it's funny, it's almost got a little bit of a vinegary uh, fragrance. Now, if you open it and it does not smell like cabbage, uh, a little maybe vinegary smelling cabbage, you'll know. If it smells bad, you, you will know. It'll, it'll have such a horrible smell, you would never want to eat it. Um, I've never had a batch of uh, sauerkraut uh, not ferment correctly or go bad. It's pretty easy to make. And I think this is gonna be quite delicious. So usually this is a, a good time, you know, when you take your weight out and oh my gosh, this is so effervescent. Now I have on top of here, I have uh, cabbage leaves because the way I make my sauerkraut is I put in the uh, grated cabbage and then I uh, use the, um, a couple of the outer leaves on top to further help kind of weight everything down and keep it um, submerged. I'm just gonna take a taste and see how this has come along. Mm -hmm. It's really good. It's nice and tangy. It still has some crunch and that'll continue to um, ferment and soften, but at a much slower rate in the refrigerator. It's quite good right now. So I'm gonna put that lid back on. Alrighty, and this, I'm just gonna leave this a little longer until I until this can uh, become slightly more acidic. So in any event, I hope that's, I think I went on a little long. I'm always a little long-winded. I hope that this has helped give some explanation as to why sometimes I use the paper cap and other times why I use a, a metal uh, canning uh, lid and canning ring um, in the fermentation process. Alrighty, that's that. Now, on to something fun. I wanted to share with all of you this apron. This is another apron that I purchased from Heidi at Rain Country Homestead's Etsy shop. And I had mentioned this in my other news for the nest. I love her aprons, they're just delightful. And I had said to her, do you have one that has some birds, some fabric that has birds? And she said, oh yes I do. And so she was able to make this for me. And I really like it because the cardinal has a lot of special meaning to our family. Um, my, I've always liked birds, but my husband really liked birds. And when we were first dating, he would talk a lot about birds and show me the birds that were living around his house and whatnot. And, and we just both always really liked the cardinal. And so this apron is just perfect. And I just wanted to back up a little because I think in the other one, I wasn't able to, the other uh, news from the nest, I wasn't able to show you the whole apron. I hope you can see more. I'm trying to see if I'm getting it all into the viewfinder, but as you see, the fabric is so generous on this. It's just beautiful and has long ties behind the neck and long ties behind the waist. It's really, really beautiful. Plus, it's got these delightful little pockets in the front. And the, the, all the stitching is beautiful and it's so well done. So anyways, I wanted to share that with you. And I'll link below 
to Heidi's Etsy shop, uh, so you can head over there if, if you'd like to get an apron too. Sometimes she makes them and puts them up on her shop for sale, and other times she um, takes special orders, like in the case of this one. So also too, you have to excuse me, this is the first time I'm doing this with the viewfinder, because uh, last time I realized that when I was showing you some things, uh, you couldn't see them, because I didn't have the viewfinder turned around. This time I have it turned around. Now I'm like kind of going back and forth between the camera and the viewfinder, so forgive me if I'm not always looking you right in the eye. <laughs> okay, the other thing that I wanted to show you this is all wet. <laughs> that was really effervescent, wasn't it? Uh, the other thing that I want to show you is the basil salt, because this was what got cut off in the other news for the nest. Now, let me go get another, that fork is wet from the cabbage, so let me just get another fork here, because I want to show you, because this was something that I also had a lot of questions on, and I don't know if the color can show up on this because it is very faint, but it did, the basil did turn the salt a pale green. And oh, in, in case you didn't see the other video, uh, how I came to do this was uh, another gal, I was on, just on YouTube, it wasn't something she had done, but she just posted a, um, I think by now she, she has done it off to see if I can find the link, but uh, she posted a uh, article that she had found somewhere, I can't remember exactly, about preserving basil in different ways. And one was grinding it up in the salt, and I think that's what I would do next time. But the other one was to lay the basil in, um, in a jar in layers and then put salt, basil, salt, basil, salt, so on and so forth. And this is how it preserves the basil. I don't know if you can see that. It's still very, this is just a small leaf, but it's very, uh, <laughs> it's very pliable. It kept it very soft and, and, and fairly green. And if you can see that, it's very, very pliable. It's interesting. And it does, the salt did take on uh, quite a basil fragrance, and it has a little bit of a basil taste. Not as strong as I would have liked, so I think that's why next time I'm gonna actually grind the basil and the salt together. I think that'll be wonderful. Well, that's that for that. Now, one other thing that I wanted to mention before I go is, I don't know if any of you have seen this book. This is the Three Season Diet. And this is a wonderful book. It's by John Dulyard, maybe? I'm not sure I pronounce his name. Now this is an older book. This was written in 2000. So it, uh, you, you might be able to find this at your library or um, uh, even at a used bookstore. That's where I actually found this copy. What is so interesting to me about this, you might say three seasons, we have four seasons, and he explains that what he's focused on is that there are basically three growing seasons. So what are you eating in the spring? What are you eating in the summer? And then what are you eating in the fall? And he stretches each season slightly like, um, I think he does like mid-March to mid-June for spring, and then summer is mid-June to I think mid-October, and then uh, his fall slash winter is like mid-October, I think that was it, or early, through uh, February, something like that. And that, because in many uh, regions of the world, you're not growing things in the dead of winter. And so what are you eating? You're eating things that you have uh, preserved or fermented or dried or whatever the case may be during those winter months. And it, I found it fascinating because he talks about how our gut flora actually changes with the seasons, making our bodies more prepared to eat certain foods at different times of the year. And we have more gut flora in the winter to digest uh, breads that we might be baking with grain that had been harvested 
earlier in the year. And it's just things like that, so on and so forth. I found it fascinating. And so I experimented. And this summer, in the summer, he talks about eating a lot of fruit. And I know a lot of us can get very nervous and scared about that, especially if we're trying to watch carbs and lose weight and whatnot. And I've already shared with you in my prior news from the nest that I've already lost quite a bit of weight, but probably just eating a very sane, mixed diet of foods. I can't do low carb, high carb. None, none of that worked for me. I just settled in with pretty much an average 40% uh, uh, carbs, 40% fat, and about 20% protein. But I'll link to my other uh, news from the nest where I talk more about that. But so this summer, I really gave myself license, so to speak, to eat more fruit. And oh gosh, I've just so enjoyed it because the fruit is just so glorious in the summer. And I felt really good and it gave me a lot of energy and I was enjoying it and not depriving myself. And I've actually lost a few more pounds over this summer. So that was very good. And so I found what he had to share in here very interesting. And I've been able to enjoy a lot of fruit this summer. So if, uh, I highly recommend looking for this book if you're interested in, in learning really what it means to eat with the seasons and uh, how our uh, gut flora is designed to eat certain things at different times of the year. And I thought that's kind of nice if, if you have trouble, you know, as I had said, um, sticking with one diet or another. If you wait through each season, your diet actually kind of changes. As he talks about in the winter, you know, eating more meats, you know, and a heavier diet, more fats. And then in the early spring, eating more vegetables and so on and so forth. In the summer, more fruits. So not that you don't eat the other foods as well, but in any event, I just found that fascinating. Well, that's that. Now, if you have any questions, I know I kind of went on long about the, the different uh, types of uh, lids that I use. And sorry, it wasn't very scientific, just from a home cook's understanding of it all. Um, but if you have uh, knowledge about all of this, I'd love to hear about it in the comments below. And if you have any questions, um, please leave them in the comments below. I'm happy to try and answer, or if I don't know the answer, I'll try to look it up or, or find somebody who does. If you'd like to learn more about traditional foods cooking, making things like sauerkraut and vinegar from strawberry tops, I hope that you'll subscribe to my channel. And be sure to click on the little notification bell that'll let you know each time I upload a new video. Well, that's all for today, but I want to thank you so much for joining me for this news from the nest, and I look forward to having you join me next time right here in my Texas Hill Country Kitchen. Love and God bless.